Ever wonder why they call rush hour, rush hour? It's it's oxymoronic given the fact that you creep along the highway at speeds a slug could suppress. And if you happen to be on a toll road, you are in for a world of trouble. As you sit in line of scores of cars as drivers fumble for their change from their ashtrays and their pockets before being allowed to pass. No rush hour should be called hurry up and wait. Unless, of course, you have an easy pass. Once you've installed that little digital toll tender on your windshield, you breeze to the head of the line and wing your way home. But too bad life doesn't offer an easy pass to jump to the head of the line. We're in the narrative today, two of Jesus' followers, James and John, they make an inappropriate request for an easy pass. Let us sit at your right and left hands in the kingdom, Lord. They wanted to follow Jesus straight through the toll booth and right into a place of prominence in heaven. Well, in the Gospel of Matthew, their mother made the same request. And there's no contradiction in the nature of the request. Mother and son were in agreement in requesting honored places in Christ's kingdom. And that request showed how little they had learned. Instead of acknowledging Jesus' anticipation of suffering and death, they imagined a triumphal scene with themselves, sitting in positions of honor and power at Christ Jesus' right and his left. They failed to understand the suffering they must face before living in the glory of God's kingdom. But Jesus knew that they were clueless in what they were asking. Both mother and sons missed is that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. It is not centered in man-made palaces and thrones within the hearts of his followers. Well, in frustration, Jesus asked them, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And they replied, we are able. My brothers and sisters, the cup and the baptism are metaphors for the suffering and death that Jesus faces. But Jesus took the disciples aside and he told them what was going to happen to him. And he's repeated this prediction three times. And James and John say that they're willing to face any trial for Christ. Oh, it's easy to say we will endure anything for Christ. But when given a chance, most of us complain about the minor task or challenge. Oh, sure, we may say that we're willing to suffer for Christ. But are we willing to accept the challenges that come when we serve God's people? Ones who don't look like us or ones who don't smell like us? In Mark, the only ones to be at Jesus left and right will be the two criminals crucified with him when he's enthroned as king of the Jews. Now the other disciples, sure, they were upset with James and John when they learned of their request. Because after all, all of the disciples wanted to be the greatest. And Jesus called them together and tries to describe how the dominion of God is different than the dominions of the world. He referred to rulers in the pagan world of the Roman Empire. Well, they exercise authority as tyrants, an authority that stands in contrast to the authority displayed by Jesus. Jesus reiterates that to be great is to be a servant. And that certainly challenges normal expectations. But even in antiquity, there was appreciation for rulers who provided public service. 
Well, Jesus pushes matters to an extreme when he goes on to say that to be first is to be a slave of all. And slaves were at the bottom of the social ladder. And there was no honor or reward in working for others as a slave. Well, this concept is not simply theoretical proposition, nor is it given as a command only to Jesus' disciples. For in the text, Jesus is speaking about himself. And like the disciples, Jesus did not come to be served but to serve. Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for the sins of men. And this phrase, my brothers and sisters, is important for thinking about how Jesus understood his ministry and his purpose. It has often been read in comparison with the servant in Isaiah chapter 53 and used to think of Jesus' death in terms of an atonement or as a guilt offering for the sins of the world. Rather, to think of Jesus as one who takes the form of a slave himself and was obedient to the point of death on the cross. With Jesus' prediction of his death and resurrection, it teaches us that these events they were a part of God's plan from the beginning and not by accident. When we look at Jesus, he's a perfect example of servanthood. And because of Jesus' obedience, even suffering and death, Jesus made an offering which we could not make in Christ. We are freed from the power of sin and reconciled back to God. Jesus once said that my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Well, as food is to the body, so is obedience to the soul and to the spirit. Working for God is nourishes and energizes and strengthens and enlightens, bringing us even more satisfaction than things we typically think of as satisfying. And even when self-denial hurts, obeying God brings joy. Well, God clearly shows that the greater the capacity, the greater the responsibility. But we also find that though there is an equality in opportunity, there are differences in talent. And with God's gifts, it is the same. It's not how much talent one has, but how one uses it that is important to God. So talents, my brothers and sisters, should be equated with spiritual gifts. It's not how many gifts that God gives to a person. It's what one does with them. Well, the Bible explains that God has given each and every one of us time and talent and treasure and countless opportunities to use these gifts. I came here to the cathedral approximately two years ago. And one of the first people I met was Rob Fulton. From that day and still today, he's always greeted me with kindness and love and compassion and understanding. And what I appreciate about him the most is that he's given me countless opportunities to serve on various ministries. You see, I'm clear with my call. I've been called to serve, not to be served. And when we give to God, when we use our time for God, when we use our talents for God, 
We help spread the gospel and open the door to God's abundant blessings. And God promises that it will be given to you and he will, you will receive an abundant harvest with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. The theme this year for our stewardship program is to be present. And so today I encourage you, be present in giving of your finances. Be present in sharing your unique God-given gifts with this community. Be present in sharing your time and talents to fulfill the mission to share Christ's love in the world. And be present. And let others see that you are a servant of God. So when we transition from this life into the next, we want to hear God say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Well done.